want to go at your own pace, check out the written version at https colon slash slash winter dot dev. I want to get familiar with the process of releasing a game before I finish Metal Sphere Rising, so I'm planning on making a game in a month, then releasing it on Steam or something. My brother and I were talking about it and came up with the idea of a space version of the Diablo planes. The objective would be to find three space stations and destroy them. Then YouTube started serving me falling sand videos, and I thought that it would be cool to use that for this project. And here we are. Let's look at how the tech behind these simulations work, and then I'll use them to make a cool game in a few weeks. Simulating falling sand is no different from any other cellular automata. We have a big grid of cells and a set of rules that get applied to each cell every frame. You've probably heard of the game of life. In that cellular automata, the rules are based on the number of neighbors surrounding a cell. For falling sand, we mostly look at if there is an empty space below a cell for it to move into. This creates the look of particles cascading down. One of the more interesting aspects of cellular automata is how complex behavior can emerge from such simple rules. That sounds like an interesting project could be created from only a few lines of code. Let's look at how you could go about making one of these in the Java version of processing. You can download processing from a link below if you want to follow along. We'll start with the standard setup and draw functions. Before we fill these in, we should establish what our particles will be. For simplicity, color will determine the particle types. So let's define some colors at the top. In setup, we need to set the size and background. I like to use a size of 800 by 800 pixels, and we need to set the background to the empty particle color. We should also uncap the frame rate from 60 to allow this to run faster if it can. Each time the draw function is called, we'll step our simulation. Because we are only using color, let's use the pixels array as the storage for our cells. Each frame we need to call load pixels to copy the displayed frame into the pixels array. This first frame will be all empty because we called background. After we load the pixels, we can iterate over them and check if they match a particle type that we know about. We want sand to form dune-like shapes, so let's encode a pyramid into its rules. We need to check directly below, down to the left, and down to the right. By default it should move down if possible. But if that cell is occupied, we'll check the other two directions. This looks okay, but the order of if statements matters. Because we put the left check before right, if both spaces are open, the particle will always move left. This creates an artificial look, but we can easily fix it by adding a little randomness to shuffle the direction if both cells are empty. Finally, we can close the for loops and call update pixels to copy our frame to the display. To draw particles on the screen with the mouse, we can add these lines after load pixels. You can create other particle types by adding more rules in a similar way. For example, water and a stationary barrier type are the most straightforward and where I would start. Water is like sand, but we check directly to the left and right instead of diagonal, which gives the effect of liquid flow. Barriers have no movement properties, but will fill space so other particles can't move through them. I saved the helper functions for last to highlight two common issues. The biggest gotcha with these types of simulations is that the order of iteration affects the behavior dramatically, and if we aren't careful, we could end up updating particles multiple times or even lose them entirely. We have four options for how we order the iteration. No matter which we pick, there will always be slight issues. Let's see why. If we iterate top to bottom, we end up updating the same particle multiple times. This results in a teleportation effect, where a particle will only take a single frame to reach the floor. We could change the iteration to bottom to top, but then if we want particles that move up, we run into the same issue. This highlights the fact that no matter which direction we pick, there will always be issues. Clearly, the solution must have more to it than just finding a magic ordering. The band-aid solution in this processing version comes from the subtle detail of how the pixels array works. In the helper functions, we read and write to the pixels array, but in draw we use the get function. Even though the docs don't say this, get must read from the displayed pixels array, which we don't update until we call update pixels. This allows us to dodge the issue of updating particles multiple times, because nothing updates until the end of the frame from get's perspective. The second problem we can only mitigate. In is empty, we don't use get because we want information about the current frame as it updates. If we use get, two particles could both think that a cell is empty, move in, and one would be lost. Even though we've somewhat fixed that issue, the order of iteration still matters. Now the order on the x-axis determines who moves in first, so we still have inconsistent behavior. Now that we have an idea of how the basics work and common pitfalls, let's jump over to C++ and see how these can be solved. I plan on expanding this over the next few videos, so I'm going to try and make it more of a general sand framework. To start, we don't want to edit the pixels directly because we want more properties than just color. Let's make a cell type enum and store it in a cell struct along with a color. In the first version, sand and water both needed to check if the space directly below is free. This hints that the ways that the particles move doesn't have to reflect their type. So let's keep two enums in each cell, one for the movement properties and the other for the type. If we use a bit string for the properties, they can be combined to create more complex patterns. 
Now that we have defined our cell, we need a way to store them. Let's make a new class called sandworld and store an array of cells in it. In the constructor, we can specify a width, height, and scale in pixels. This will allow us to easily change the size of the cells. We'll need some functions for getting the cells out of the world. Let's add two, one that takes x and y coordinates and another that takes a flat index. And to get us back to where we were, let's add the same helper functions from before. Processing gave us two arrays to work with, but before we just add another one and call it a day, let's think about a way to actually solve the issues that arise from the iteration ordering. The main problem is that moves are executed as they come, but really we should gather all the possible moves, then execute them at the ends to give each one a fair chance. Let's add a vector to the sand world and make a new function called moveCell that adds a move to the list. After we finish iterating over our cells, we can apply the changes. First we need to remove any changes that were filled between frames by the setCell function. Then we need to sort the list of moves by their destination. Then we can iterate over the sorted moves. Each time the destination changes, we'll pick a random source to move from. This allows each particle to get a fair chance at moving into a cell. Finally, we'll clear the changes. That's it for the core of our little framework. Let's see how we can use it to make what we had in the processing version. I'm going to be using my own game engine for this. Let me know in the comments if you want to follow along, and I can package it up and write some documentation. But in this video, I'm going to skip over the non-sandy details. You can check out the full source below if you're interested. In an update function, we'll iterate over the cells in a similar way as before. But now that we have a bit string of movement properties, we can check each one until its respective move function returns true. We can make a function for each movement property that will return true if it finds a valid move. To draw particles with the mouse, we can create some defaults in an init function. Then at the top of our update function, we'll add these lines. The last thing I want to cover is about making games inside of these simulations. Let's think about the most basic feature we need, and then in future posts I'll expand on this. Having a player that moves around seems like a good place to start, so let's think about how that might work. We'll need some notion of a group of particles that can move together. Let's create a tile struct that holds a list of positions for its particles and a position for the group itself. For now, we'll just use the rock particle for everything in the tile. Before we update the world, we need to paste the tile particles in, so let's put these lines in the update function before the main loops. After we called commit cells and updated the texture, we can remove the tiles by setting their cells to empty. Finally, we can make a little ship and add some basic movement. In the init function, we'll make a tile and add it to a list. In the update function, before the world updates, we can add these lines to move our ship. It's important to move the tiles before pasting them in so they can be removed correctly at the end. And that about covers it. We're left with a decently quick simulation. On my computer, it runs between 0.005 to 0.015 seconds per frame, which is around 200 to 60 frames per second. Currently, we can only use one thread, so if your computer has four cores, we're only using one fourth, or more likely one eighth of its power. In the next post, I'm going to cover how we could make the worlds bigger, and how multi-threading the simulation works. Then we'll make a game with it. So stay tuned if this seems interesting.